Retired murder squad detective Trevor Marriott spent his career catching killers. Today he is focused on trying to crack one of the world's oldest cold cases. He's going to use all his detective skills to identify the man who is suspected of killing five women in East London. Once a copper, always a copper, yeah? That's what they say. Jack the Ripper's identity has remained a mystery for more than 120 years. Marriott's team of experts from the fields of forensic science, pathology, and criminal psychology employ for the first time virtual 3D recreations of the victim's post-mortems. The world of people who are living in fantasies is the darkness. As Marriott's investigations take him from the streets of East London to America and Germany, he uncovers a man who may have killed on two continents. Over a century since he stalked the streets, the hunt for Jack the Ripper has begun again. London, 1888, a city in the grip of what has become known as the Autumn of Terror. Over three months, five women were brutally slain, their bodies hideously mutilated. The killer, known only as Jack the Ripper, has evaded detection for over 120 years. From a forensic point of view, the, the, the trail is almost completely cold. In Victorian times, they didn't have such things as DNA, CCTV. I can see he's going to be a mammoth task. More than a century ago, Whitechapel, East London, was a confusing labyrinth of dark alleyways and streets. Today, Jack the Ripper wouldn't recognize the city. Marriott begins his investigations on the same streets where the killer stalked his prey. This is Derwood Street, formerly Bucks Row. It's where the Ripper's Autumn of Terror began. There's nothing like going to an original crime scene to get a feel of the crime and everything surrounding it. You can't get everything from looking at pictures. I'm going to try and take myself back to the days of 1888 and how the police would have dealt with it and try to look into the mind of the killer as well. The first murder took place on Friday, August the 31st. Mary Ann Nichols, commonly known as Polly, was a prostitute and an alcoholic. Hello, love. Hello, darling. An old roommate was the last person to see her alive. You couldn't let the stomach, could you? I ain't got a time. You take care of yourself. A lot of the prostitutes in Whitechapel at the time were of very low class and had to do almost everything and anything in order to try to survive on a daily basis. Hey, hello, sir. Are you looking for some company tonight, then? Hey? They would have approached almost every man that they came across. Come on then, love. This way. With a view to uh, prostituting themselves to obtain money. At 3.45 a.m., a man on his way to work discovered Polly's mutilated body. The police, there's been a murder! She's dead! Her clothes were pulled up around her waist, her throat had been cut to the point that her head had almost been decapitated, and she'd been subjected to some abdominal mutilation. The killer had slashed Polly's throat and stabbed her in the abdomen. There were no witnesses and no clues. The police conducted house-to-house -house inquiries, but nobody saw anything, nobody heard anything, and the killer just disappeared into the night. How could the killer just disappear without trace? To find out, Marriott needs to understand what life was like in the White Chapel of 1888. 
he has come to the Museum of London to meet historian Alex Werner. There were quite frequently murders that took place at night, and usually they got one line in the newspaper. This map reveals why. It shows that London's most desperate class of people lived in Whitechapel. Whitechapel was a very unruly population. It was a very difficult area to police, so crime levels were very high. There was a warren of alleys and little streets and side routes. If you were a criminal and knew your way around, you could actually move much, much quicker than a policeman could. If you tried to catch someone, they'd be off running and you'd lose them within seconds. A very dangerous place at night time. Whitechapel was the perfect killing ground. Eight days later, he struck again. Forty-seven-year-old Annie Chapman was also a prostitute. Right, I've got a little place down there. I'll take you. She was last seen talking to an unidentified man at 5.30 in the morning. Thirty minutes later, her mutilated body was found in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street. Wait. Oh my God! There's been a murder! Quick, get the police! The killer had taken a risk because somebody could have quite easily come into that backyard. Somebody from one of the windows above could quite easily have looked out and seen the crime being committed. Like with Nichols, the killer had slashed Annie Chapman's throat. But the autopsy report revealed the brutality of the attack. Even in Whitechapel's crime-ridden streets, the viciousness of the murders stood out. The abdomen had been entirely laid open. The uterus and its appendages, with the upper portion of the vagina and the posterior two-thirds of the bladder, had been entirely removed. The killer was still at large. He became known as Jack the Ripper. Fear swept through London's East End. It was quite clear that, that the killer was targeting prostitutes. He was seeking them out in the very early hours of the morning and obviously going with them to secluded locations. <gasps> To catch the killer, Marriott must think like him. He must work out the Ripper's means, motive, and opportunity to commit the crime. In his investigation room, Marriott will use modern policing techniques to collate and analyze all the available information. People have been so desperate to uncover the mystery of Jack the Ripper that a lot of people have exaggerated the strength of what the facts are that they've uncovered. A lot of what has been looked on as, as evidence for 120 years actually isn't evidence at all. It, it's nothing more than uh, wild, uncorroborated theories. Marriott consults a world-famous criminal psychologist. Thomas Müller has interviewed many of the world's most notorious serial killers, including German Armin Nevis, who ate one of his victims. I cannot think like these guys. I can just walk in the shoes. And it's four o'clock in the morning and it is dark. And here's the guy who has this cruel fantasies. He cannot sleep. He's just nervous all the time. And he is coming in the dark area. There's the prostitute standing here and asking him a question. And here comes the fantasy, the stress, and here is the victim of opportunity. Taking out the night. Then he can do everything what he knows. He knows that area. That's exactly what you see and where this guy can, can act out his fantasy. Step one for Muller is examining who the Ripper killed. Killers are selecting their victims by the opportunity and the level of the risk factor. It's clear, the prostitute is a high-risk victim. 
and just to talk with her, bringing her in a dark area, this is not hard job. So that's someone who is not the person who can talk a lot, who can lure these people from society. Müller believes it wasn't the killing that motivated the Ripper, but the need for a body. You have a typical classical type of blitz attack here. Quick punch, you get a control over the victim, you cut the throat and nothing else. He has done a killing, but he is not satisfied. The killing itself is not what he wants, because he has done it. The fantasy is the mutilation, that these abnormal, disorganized sexual behavior on a dead body. Over the past 120 years, about 140 potential killers have been suggested by numerous ripperologists. Their suspects range from artists and doctors to lunatics and royalty. To strip away the full suspects, Marriott will concentrate on his motive. Why would the Ripper want to kill and mutilate prostitutes? By mid-September 1888, London was living in fear of the killer known only as Jack the Ripper. Marriott wants to understand what motivated him to kill. The Ripper targeted prostitutes, but there is no evidence he ever had sex with them. Criminal psychologist Müller believes this marks him out as a very special type of killer. We say normal sexuality is there when somebody is serving a sexual need with a sexual act. But sometimes Mother Nature is turning it 180 degrees around, and then you have people there servicing a sexual need with a non-sexual act. So that sexual gratification is starting with stamp wounds, the next time carving on a body, or even replacing body parts. It's a development in the way where every normal person would say, hey, where's the sex in the crime? But these people are living in different rooms of experiences we can never enter. Müller believes a killer motivated by abnormal sexual fantasies cannot control himself and will keep on murdering. If you have seen a pornography picture 15 times, it's losing the gratification. You need a little bit more. And that's the same thing when these people are dr driving up with their fantasy. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit more. Three weeks after the killings of Chapman and Nichols, the Ripper struck again. Ripperologists know September the 30th, 1888, as the double event. At 1 a.m., a man found the body of another prostitute. Murder! 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 The killer had cut 44-year-old Elizabeth Stride's throat but her body was not mutilated. Some investigators believe this is because the Ripper was disturbed and had to flee. Marriott, though, is unconvinced. Everything about that particular murder was wrong. The location, she was found murdered at the side of an international workers' club, which was packed full of uh, men that particular evening. The time. It was round about one o'clock in the morning. Members of the public would have been walking about nearby. The murder weapon was described as being a much smaller knife, totally different to the knife used in the other murders. Questions remain about the death of Stride, but Marriott is in no doubt who was responsible for the next killing that night. P.C. Watkins discovered murdered 46-year-old prostitute Catherine Eddowes at 1.45 a.m. Her body was even more mutilated than the other victims of the Autumn of Terror. Watkins said she was ripped up like a pig in market. You could see her throat had been cut to the point of decapitation 
She'd had very severe abdominal mutilations to the point that her intestines had been drawn out. Today, Mitre Square has changed, but the actual spot where Edos was murdered remains. Marriott wants to know how the killer carried out his crime. According to the police report, the Ripper could have only had about nine minutes to kill and mutilate Edos in almost total darkness. It was very lucky because there were three entrances into the square. Obviously, at that time of the night, it would have been very quiet. So the Ripper may well have heard the footsteps of PC Watkins coming back into the square and giving him the opportunity to make good his escape through one of the other exits. The original autopsy photos and drawings detail her injuries. Her throat was cut and her abdomen ripped open. But there was more. The killer had slashed her face. To understand the extent of the injuries, Marriott consults forensic surveyor Duncan Lees. His job is to create accurate images for use in high-profile modern murder trials. The classic thing these days is the balance, really, that you've got to strike between providing accurate information for juries and inquests and not providing information that's too emotive. From the original autopsy reports, Lees has recreated Eddowes' injuries. We've tried to treat the case exactly as though it was a report that had fallen on our desk two weeks ago. We've gone through the list of injuries as best we can, taken all the information and presented it in a balanced and objective format. The image clearly shows the Ripper has carved crosses and symbols on Eddowes' face. Like Chapman, she had her uterus skillfully removed, but Eddowes had another organ missing. The peritoneal lining was cut through on the left side and the left kidney carefully taken out and removed. Marriott is uncertain how anyone could have done this in nine minutes in almost total darkness. Muller explains how he thinks the killer's deviant fantasies could drive these acts of mutilation. I would say that the stress of that guy was very, very high because he made a lot of risk to act out that type of fantasy because he was not only removing the body parts, he was making symbols in the facial areas. If this is really done in nine minutes, in totally darkness, then I can tell you how often he has done that in his fantasy, you know? It's, it's still there. He's doing it blind, like people can typewriting without looking at the, at the machine. That was very important for that guy. He was raising up his risk to do that crime at that time, at that place. That tells me that the guy is pretty much now at the end of his possibility to live with these type of fantasies. Whether the killer was being driven insane by his fantasies or not, what Marriott does know is that it took medical skill to remove his victim's organs. For the next part of the investigation, he wants to find out how important a clue that is to the Ripper's identity. By the end of September 1888, the man known as Jack the Ripper was the prime suspect for the murder and mutilation of four prostitutes in East London. His fourth victim, Eddowes, had both her uterus and left kidney removed. So, was the Ripper a medical man? Suspects have ranged from a quack American doctor to Queen Victoria's own surgeon. Marriott is unconvinced. Nine minutes is a very short space of time to effect those removals and, of course, commit the murder and inflict the other injuries that were inflicted on Eddowes. To examine if this is possible, Forensics expert Duncan Lees created this anatomically correct 3D body of Eddowes. The model allows Marriott to study the victim's wounds and see how her organs were removed. Technology allows in real time to take a virtual tour of the unfortunate victims. You can move the body around, you can take organs away, you can look at the skin, you can look under the skin. We're not making anything up here. We're taking real information and looking at it in a forensic sense. 
To complete the virtual autopsy team, Marriott has called on expert pathologists. Dr. Ian Calder is a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists. With some 30 years' experience into sudden and unnatural death, he has conducted tens of thousands of autopsies. Mortuary manager Phil Harrison has, in his 20-year career, removed many thousands of organs. I believe that the knife entered the throat right at the centre yes. and was drawn across to the left, almost decapitating the head. There is no doubt Eddowes died quickly, but could the Ripper have removed her organs in almost total darkness? Just how difficult would it have been for somebody to be able to get hold of the uterus and the fallopian tubes? Because I imagine a large incision and, and then being able to have to part the, the walls of the skin to try to gain access. I mean, once you start to cut into the gut, then you've got a very difficult technical problem getting the gut out and moving around the abdomen. And I think Phil only knows too well if we get things like a peritonitis, then you feel it really becomes almost slippery and almost impossible to do. The organs are covered in blood, in faeces, etc., which makes the grip much more difficult. Yes, that's right. Yes. The removal of the uterus is made more complicated by its proximity to the delicate bladder. If we were to take the, the, the uterus out, we can see the shape of it, and the autopsy report says that it was actually cut off halfway down. In a frenzied attack, with the bladder being in such close relation, you could very easily damage the bladder and the, the post-mortem report says that the bladder was intact because it had urine in. There's an interesting dichotomy here, isn't there? With some of these victims, we're seeing an initial kind of frenzied almost, cutting and stabbing and tearing, but then at the same time, the organs that are missing have been quite carefully removed and that, that jars with me. If the careful removal of the uterus causes doubts, what about the kidney? Now, we have a crime scene location which is almost in total darkness. Dr Calder, would you say that nine minutes was sufficient time for even a skilled surgeon to have removed those organs? I don't think so. The kidney is surrounded by perinephric fats. You have to actually literally pluck them, and so it's quite an art to know how to get the planes of cleavage to get the knife in and your fingers in to get them removed. So you've got dark, you've also not got probably knowledge of doing it several times before, then it's going to be technically quite difficult. I think it's, it's not in the realms of possibility that somebody can do it in, in the circumstances that have been described. This expert opinion is a turning point in Marriott's investigation. Further research puts forward a new theory. He discovers that there was a thriving trade in organs and body parts in the 19th century. It would make sense if the organs were removed in the mortuary before the autopsy. Marriott believes he can now look beyond suspects from the medical world, bucking 120 years of suspicions. I'm excited by the find um, because now it really tends to turn the whole Jack the Ripper mystery uh, upside down and, and possibly rules out an important and integral part of what has been the Ripper mystery. The Autumn of Terror had a fifth victim. Mary Jane Kelly was a 25-year-old prostitute. She was last seen returning home with a man in the early hours of November the 9th, 1888. Come on in. I won't buy. Later that morning, a rent collector discovered her body. Come on, open up the rent, Joe! The scene that greeted the police officers was almost like a butcher's shop. Her face had been horribly mutilated. Large chunks of skin had been stripped from her thigh muscles. All her internal organs had been stripped. Her body was, in effect, nothing more than a carcass. 
Kelly was found inside a locked room. The Ripper had taken his time to eviscerate her body. Keep in mind the Chapman case, because she was in a backyard, so that means you have to go from the street through a small tunnel, you're coming in a backyard, he feels a little bit more safe, and then he was acting out more behavior. In the Kelly case, there was another row of security. Backyard, the door, inside the room, and then he can act out everything what he did. Forensics expert Duncan Lees has recreated Kelly's horrific wounds from the original crime scene photographs. Marriott wants to know how frenzied and wild the attack was. To disfigure her and dismember her, the killer moved the body across the bed, away from the wall, so that he could gain access to do all of this. The attacker's frenzied, but on the other hand, it's not as if he's kind of gone in and stabbed and flailed away and, and bits have flown around. Uh, and landed near the body. Parts of the body have been removed and placed around the room. Muller sees this calculated butchery as consistent with a killer finally able to satisfy his fantasies. We call that depersonation, taking away the, the personality. He doesn't want to know who that person is. It's just like a white wall where he can bring the whole fantasy inside there. I've spoken with a lot of people, they say, when I really acted out that fantasy, I went home and then I was, I was able to sleep, then I was really tired, and then that was possible the first time that they can, I can lay down. The autumn of terror was over. Mary Kelly was the last of the Ripper murders in London. But Marriott doesn't believe the killer could choose to stop killing. Sometimes they stop for a short period, sometimes they stop for a long period, but a serial killer will continue to kill. They never stop. Marriott is convinced Jack the Ripper didn't just vanish, he went somewhere else. In a newspaper report, he finds a lead a ripper-like murder in New York. Retired murder squad detective Trevor Marriott is on a journey to uncover the identity of Jack the Ripper. He is following up a lead, a ripper-like murder in New York's Lower East Side in 1891, nearly three years after London's Autumn of Terror. Where you have a number of similar murders that have been committed in different areas, there is always suggestion that there may be a connection, and that certainly has to be explored to its fullest. New York in the late 19th century was the first port of call in America for tens of thousands of European immigrants. If Jack the Ripper had come here, he probably would have arrived on the southern tip of Manhattan. In the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge, Marriott's come to meet local historian Rob Hollander. He wants to know what sort of people lived in New York's Lower East Side. It was, in some ways, the end of the earth. There were a lot of prostitutes in that neighborhood. There were a lot of suspicious characters. The New York Times described this neighborhood as a den of gamblers, thieves, and roughs of every description. The Lower East Side was even more densely populated than London's East End, with over 330,000 people crammed into two square miles. Hollander thinks there'd be no better hiding place for the Ripper. This was crime central. If he wanted to disappear into the city, this was the ideal place. It was so easy. The death Marriott is investigating is that of 60-year-old Carrie Brown, a prostitute. Known locally as Old Shakespeare, a night clerk discovered her mutilated body in the notorious East River Hotel in April 1891. A witness reported seeing Brown enter the hotel room with an unknown man. Marriott looks for similarities to the killings in Whitechapel. 
She was a prostitute. She was found in a locked room, which is very similar to Mary Kelly. And she'd had abdominal mutilations inflicted upon her. Some of her intestines had uh, uh, protruded out as a result of those wounds. And in fact, on this occasion, the knife was found at the murder location. The murder weapon is a significant clue. The killer had used it to inflict wounds similar to those of the London victims. Examining the autopsy photographs of Brown, Marriott finds further evidence. The killer had carved two crosses into her body. The photograph clearly shows the cross which has been carved by the killer on the back of Carrie Brown. It is a large, significant cross. The second photo shows the smaller cross carved on her abdomen. These crosses echo the ones etched into the face of the Ripper's fourth victim, Catherine Eddowes. Eddowes had two small crosses uh, which were carved on her cheekbones. Crosses on two bodies, on two continents, gives Marriott a link between the murders. The crosses could be a signature of the killer. Um, it, it's, it's not unusual for serial killers to do something to the victim which indicates a signature. I was really overjoyed because it's something that has been staring people in the face for 120 years and nobody has actually spotted it up until this date. So really that's a new discovery as far as the Ripper mystery is concerned. Marriott believes he is a step closer to uncovering the identity of Jack the Ripper. But more investigation is needed to name the killer. In the New York Times archives, he reads of another Ripper-like murder, just blocks from the East River Hotel. Michael Hoffman, the murdered woman's son, said he was aroused by hearing his mother scream. He saw the prisoner raise the knife and cut his mother's throat. Fearing he would be killed, Hoffman said he fled to the fire escape and from that place by the light of the day. On August 31st, 1894, almost six years to the day since Polly Nichols had died in Whitechapel. 56-year-old Julianne Hoffman died here at 544 East 6th Street, New York. While the building is long gone, the killer's escape route remains. The alleyway that he escaped into would have been exactly where we are today at the back of these block of houses. He ran into the street. The sound of Michael screaming for help alerted a number of policemen who were in the vicinity and chased after him and apprehended him nearby. The police got both murderer and the murder weapon. It was the same type of knife used to kill Brown and four of the women in London. A long-bladed knife was significant to the whole Ripper investigation because with regards to all the Whitechapel murders, the uh, doctors there who did the examinations of the bodies suggested that a long-bladed knife was used to inflict the wounds to the throats of those Whitechapel victims as well. The man arrested was a German immigrant, Karl Fagenbaum. Marriott knows he killed Hoffman. But did he kill the other women? Marriott finds a statement from Fagenbaum's lawyer, William Sanford Lawton. Lawton said he'd been talking to Fagenbaum for a number of hours one night, and Fagenbaum stated that he had suffered from a singular disease which induced an all-absorbing passion. This passion manifests itself in the desire to kill and mutilate any women that came his way. And when that happened, Fagenborn said that at such a time he was unable to control himself. Lightning in my head. He has the means and the motive for committing not only the murder of Julia Hoffman, but also the murders of the prostitutes in Whitechapel in 1888. 
unlike a lot of the other suspects that have been put forward, he actually killed a woman using a knife in Ripper-like fashion. So again, that must make him a prime suspect. The motive and weapon might match, but all Marriott knows about Fagenbaum is that he was a German working as a gardener in New York. He needs to find a link that connects him to London's Autumn of Terror. Marriott has now named German Karl Fagenbaum as his prime suspect for Jack the Ripper. Reading the transcript of Fagenbaum's trial, Marriott discovers more about him. It shows that, first of all, he was a thief. It also shows that he was uh, a compulsive liar. And it also shows that he was using different identities. Marriott also discovers a statement by Fagenbaum's brother. He is convinced this is a key piece of the puzzle. He said that Fagenbaum had in fact been employed as a merchant seaman in the past. Now the statement that he had been a merchant seaman was of great interest to me and it's something that I needed to explore further. Marriott has always suspected that Jack the Ripper couldn't be found in Whitechapel because he wasn't there anymore. Being a sailor would give the killer the ideal opportunity because when his boat was berthed in the docks, he could freely go into the public domain and if he killed somewhere in Whitechapel, then he could freely walk back to his ship and no one would be any other wiser. To prove his theory, Marriott must find a ship that puts Fagenbaum in London during the Autumn of Terror. It's a daunting task. 19th century London was the center of the world's largest empire. Hundreds of ships brought trade from across the globe. Every day, the numerous docks that lined the Thames thronged with thousands of sailors. Studying the map, Marriott focuses on the two docks closest to Whitechapel. Both the St. Catherine Dock and the London Dock were located approximately 12 to 15 minute walk away from the centre of Whitechapel, where obviously all the prostitutes were to be found by seamen who came into these uh, docks with their merchant vessels. Marriott obtains a copy of the Lloyd's Shipping Gazette, which lists every vessel berthed in London in 1888. Can he match a single ship to each of the murder dates? There is a German merchant vessel called the Raya, which appears to have been here on all of the dates bar one. And having closely studied the remaining date, it shows a merchant vessel from the same fleet was here on that day in question. Marriott finds two ships operated by German shipping line, the Norddeutsche Lloyd. It's a strong lead, but to prove Fagenbaum was Jack the Ripper, he needs more. Marriott must discover if Fagenbaum worked for the Norddeutsche Lloyd and if he sailed aboard the Raya. There is obviously a definite connection between the fact that the same merchant line was here and there is every possibility that the same crew would have been employed by that merchant fleet on all of those dates. Merchant seamen were somewhat habitual in their loyalty to specific merchant lines, so I wouldn't have expected the crew list to have changed that much, in all honesty. As Germany's biggest shipping line, the Norddeutsche Lloyd employed thousands of men. Many of the ships sailed from here, Bremerhaven, on Germany's north coast. Everything in relation to that line started and finished here, all their operations, all their ships, uh, and obviously all their sailors that they employed. As well as shipping cargo between Germany and London, 
the Norddeutsche Lloyd helped carry three million Germans to the New World. There were the very fast steamships, like the one you can see here, and it took them eight days. Dr. Simon Eich is the museum director of the Bremerhaven Emigration Center. Marriott wants to know how someone like Fagenbaum could make a new life in America. Thousands of people were working here on the ships, for the ships. It was a huge business and it was very easy to get a job. The people really don't check anybody. They just take the labor and they were happy to have somebody. You could be very sure that you get a job here in Bremerhaven. And I guess that would have been possible then for a crew member joining a boat here in Bremerhaven when it arrived in New York to suddenly get off the boat and never be seen again. Yes, that, that was one possibility for criminals to escape from Europe and then to go to the United States. Marriott has no doubt that German suspect Karl Fagenbaum could have got to America this way but he still needs proof that he sailed between Germany and London. What we need as the final piece of the jigsaw is to be able to try and connect Fagenborn with Whitechapel and in particular the, uh, the specific German vessels. Marriott's hoping the answers lie in the Bremen Public Record Office. It's here that many surviving Norddeutsche Lloyd records are kept. When one comes across a vast array of original documents still intact, it does become mouth-watering to an investigator and it gets the adrenaline flowing. Marriott is in luck. Karl Fagenbaum did work for the Norddeutsche Lloyd. He is recorded working on numerous ships bound for England and New York. Here in this particular register, it clearly shows an entry for Carl Fagan born. It gives his details where he was born, his age, and it gives a list of the vessels that he worked on as a merchant seaman. Throughout his life, he appears to have had a massive connection to the Norddeutsche Line. Marriott is very close to getting his proof. He just needs to find Fagenbaum's name on the crew list of the Raya. Despite an exhausting search, Marriott hits a brick wall. For the three months of the Autumn of Terror, the Raya crew lists are missing. Very strange because uh, you know, the archives are stacked full of, of every crew list imaginable for, for every boat that virtually sailed from Bremen but uh, not, the, um, not the Raya for those particular dates. Um, I, I guess a wild speculative guess may be that um, uh, Lawton, his lawyer, had the same view and the same line of inquiry and perhaps was able to obtain the actual crew lists, which clearly put Fagenborn in Whitechapel at the time of the murders. Marriott is satisfied that he has enough evidence to name Carl Fagenbaum as Jack the Ripper. I'm of the firm belief that Carl Fagenborn was certainly involved in some or possibly all of the murders in Whitechapel. He now has just one last task. Marriott wants to know what happened to the man who was Jack the Ripper. In his investigation room, Marriott reviews the evidence against German suspect Karl Fagenbaum. Was he the man who brutally killed five women in Whitechapel, East London, during the Autumn of Terror? <laughs> Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Kelly. All were prostitutes. All were thought to be slaughtered by the Ripper. After the killing stopped in London, did he continue murdering in New York, where Carrie Brown and Juliana Hoffman were killed in Ripper-like fashion? Marriott's prime suspect, Fagenbaum, had the means and the motive to commit the crimes. 
As a merchant seaman, he also had the opportunity, as he could have easily sailed to and from New York and Europe. As a merchant seaman, he would have had free and easy access to prostitutes at all levels. Obviously, we know the Whitechapel prostitutes were at the bottom end of the scale of prostitutes. A lot of them didn't have anywhere to live at night, and so therefore, they were, in effect, easy prey. When the New York police arrested Fagenbaum for killing Juliana Hoffman, they found him with a long-bladed knife, the same type of weapon used in Whitechapel. Finally, Marriott's uncovered more damning evidence from Fagenbaum's own lips in a statement taken by Lawton, his lawyer. Lawton said that he had an innate desire that came upon him every so often that forced him to kill and mutilate women. That could be that he had psychopathic tendencies. And obviously, every so often, those psychopathic tendencies manifested themselves. And prostitutes were so easy to pick as victims. After being sentenced for murder, Fagenbaum was sent up the river to New York's notorious Sing Sing prison. Situated on the banks of the Hudson, today it is a modern maximum security facility. In the 19th century, its harsh regime was legendary. Floggings were commonplace. Being sent up the river was tantamount to a death sentence. It's somewhat surreal trying to cast your mind back to how it was in 1894 when Carl Fagenborn was present here. In the modern prison complex stands the original 19th century cell block where Carl Fagenbaum was jailed. Marriott's been granted special permission to look inside. This was built by the inmates. In 1825, it took him about three years to build this. Officer Arthur Wolpinski is Sing Sing's resident historian. It's just a shell now. Of course, back in 1884, there was a fire in here. And this was the main housing unit. And they had uh, 1,200 cells all the way down. Each cell was seven feet long three feet, three inches wide. You can touch each wall of yourself. And at times, they had to double bunk. You might have had uh, over 2,000 inmates in this housing block. Sing Sing housed some of America's worst criminals. 614 of them, men, women, and Carl Fagenbaum, all met the same fate. They would be housed in that condemned cell building. And at the time of uh, execution, they would walk a few feet into the electric chair area and be strapped into Old Sparky. Fagenbaum's date with destiny was April 27th, 1896. Led from the condemned cell, he was strapped into the chair at 11 a.m. <laughs> the executioner passed a bolt of 1,820 volts through his body. Moments later, doctors pronounced him dead. After his arrest and execution, no more unsolved Ripper-like murders were recorded. For Marriott, this leaves little doubt that Fagenbaum was responsible for most, if not all, the murders in Whitechapel. As such, he feels it's a fitting end for the man known as Jack the Ripper. I firmly believe that Carl Fagenborn was Jack the Ripper and was responsible for uh, some or all of the murders in Whitechapel in 1888. And this is where I believe Jack the Ripper finally met his end.
Retired murder squad detective Trevor Marriott spent his career catching killers. Today he is focused on trying to crack one of the world's oldest cold cases. He's going to use all his detective skills to identify the man who is suspected of killing five women in East London. Once a copper, always a copper, yeah? That's what they say. Jack the Ripper's identity has remained a mystery for more than 120 years. Marriott's team of experts from the fields of forensic science, pathology, and criminal psychology employ for the first time virtual 3D recreations of the victims' post-mortems. The world of people who are living in fantasies is the darkness. As Marriott's investigations take him from the streets of East London to America and Germany, he uncovers a man who may have killed on two continents. Over a century since he stalked the streets, the hunt for Jack the Ripper has begun again. London, 1888. A city in the grip of what has become known reveals why. It shows that London's most desperate class of people lived in Whitechapel. Whitechapel was a very unruly population. It was a very difficult area to police, so crime levels were very high. There was a warren of alleys and little streets and side routes. If you were a criminal and you knew your way around, you could actually move much, much quicker than a policeman could. If you tried to catch someone, they'd be off running and you'd lose them within seconds. A very dangerous place at night time. Whitechapel was the perfect killing ground. Eight days later, he struck again. <laughs> 47-year-old Annie Chapman was also a prostitute. I've got a little place down there I'll take you. She was last seen talking to an unidentified man at 5.30 in the morning. I'm going to try and take myself back to the days of 1888 and how the police would have dealt with it and try to look into the mind of the killer as well. The first murder took place on Friday, August the 31st. Mary Ann Nichols, commonly known as Polly, was a prostitute and an alcoholic. Hello, love. Hello, Ty. An old roommate was the last person to see her alive. You couldn't let the summit, could you? I ain't got a time. You take care of yourself. A lot of the prostitutes in Whitechapel at the time were of very low class and had to do almost everything and anything in order to try to survive on a daily basis. Hey, Lois. Are you looking for some company tonight, then? Hey? They would have approached almost every man that they came across. Come on then, love. This way. With a view to uh, prostituting themselves to obtain money. At 3.45 a.m., a man on his way to work discovered Polly's mutilated body. Police, there's been a murder! She's dead! Her clothes were pulled up around her waist. Her throat had been cut to the point that her head had almost been decapitated and she'd been subjected to some abdominal mutilation. The killer had slashed Polly's throat and stabbed her in the abdomen. There were no witnesses and no clues. The police conducted house-to-house -house inquiries, but nobody saw anything, nobody heard anything, and the killer just disappeared into the night. How could the killer just disappear without trace? To find out, Marriott needs to understand what life was like in the White Chapel of 1888. 
He has come to the Museum of London to meet historian Alex Werner. There were quite frequently murders that took place at night, and usually they got one line in the newspaper. This map as the autumn of terror. Over three months, five women were brutally slain, their bodies hideously mutilated. The killer, known only as Jack the Ripper, has evaded detection for over 120 years. From a forensic point of view, the, the, the trail is almost completely cold. In Victorian times, they didn't have such things as DNA, CCTV. I can see he's going to be a mammoth task. More than a century ago, Whitechapel, East London, was a confusing labyrinth of dark alleyways and streets. Today, Jack the Ripper wouldn't recognize the city. Marriott begins his investigations on the same streets where the killer stalked his prey. This is Durwood Street, formerly Bucks Row. It's where the Ripper's Autumn of Terror began. There's nothing like going to an original crime scene to get a feel of the crime and everything surrounding it. You can't get everything from looking at pictures. 